Sunday, Monday, happy days. Tuesday, Wednesday, happy days. Thursday, Friday, happy days. Saturday, that's a day for having lots of fun. Although, I can't really remember which day this is going out on. It's going out on the 7th of June, which isn't a Saturday from my memory. It's, um, it's a Tuesday. Yes. It's a Tuesday. And what am I supposed to be doing today? Today, from memory, I am taking flight with Draken and Rack and Dr. Dan and our colleague John Bull. All four of us, I think, are taking flight from Halli uh, from Hampton to Halifax and to go and see Sackville and the Museum of the Atlantic. So, wish us luck and bon voyage. And don't worry, those in Hamilton, we will be returning very shortly. Um, hopefully, we'll arrange something so we'll be able to meet up with everyone and have a chat for those who want to have a chat with us in Halifax. It's really quite interesting the amount of people who are, seem to be keen to actually have a meeting with us. It's, it's quite weird. For an academic. Usually when we turn up places, most people go, oh, we locked up the archives. Don't nick them. Who would actually nick the archives? Hmm. So, we are dealing with the Pensacola class, which are... Oh, what can I say about the Pensacola class? Well... This is our trip. But what can I say about the Pensacola class? They're unique. There is nothing else quite like them in the world, and honestly, the US didn't want them either. And that sounds terrible to say, but they didn't. I'm going to be going through this entire design, and I'm going to show you the genesis, I'm going to show you how the, the design came about. And the first thing you're going to realise is, A, the design which eventually produces the Northamptons is around when the Pensacola happens. That they also work out that if they're prepared to cheat wholeheartedly, they could get something which has 12 8-inch guns. They seem to kind of realise that if they did, the British would go, CHEATS! Quite loudly. At which point, goodness knows what the Brits would have done. I do laugh at the idea of there actually being a war between Britain and America in the 1920s and 30s. Wars don't happen when both sides are talking and each other's listening. They don't. Wars happen when one side is talking, uh, when the uh, side's talking and both hearing what they want to hear and only what they want to hear. That wasn't Britain and America's relationship in the 1920s. Mostly it was Britain hearing, we don't want you to do things. Okay, but how are you going to stop us? We don't want to pay for anything that actually stops you. Mm, okay, so as long as we just don't muck around in... Your part of the world, you'll leave our part of the world fine. Yep. And both deal with Japan. Yep. Oh, great. We mucked that one up, didn't we? Then we're going to make it worse with the 1930 London Treaty. <sighs> Which, of course, this comes out in the middle of. So, I spoke to you of Genesis. Well, this is Genesis. As you can see, there are various ships designed here. This is not something which comes about quickly, or easily, or simply, but actually with a lot of consideration. The first designs that we can probably trace this back to, uh, trace the Pensacola class back to, are drawn, well, technically they're drawn in 1922, but there are some even before then which seem to be being looked at. Now, one of the interesting things is they keep to the idea of a 12 8-inch gun ship 
for quite a long time. And we can all think about how powerful a 12 8 inch gun ship could have been. And then there's this lovely design here at the bottom here on the uh, left of your screen, which shows you a vessel with a hangar and a catapult aft for its aircraft, for its reconnaissance role. And its aft turret is super firing over the hangar. Now, I have to say, for a reconnaissance ship, that's a pretty good look to me. But also, this all helps us when starting to think, what is the Pensacola class being built for? Oh, what are they being built for? The US has its scouting fleet. They're being built for that. What are they being built for the battle fleet? What are they being built for? This is the, the first thing you have to ask before you're um, discussing anything to do with a ship's design. You have to ask, what is it being built for? And that's what you evaluate it against. You never say whether a design is good or bad compared to another ship because they're probably being built for different things. America might build a cruiser and Britain might build a cruiser and you can stand there and start saying this one's better than that one. But you have to ask yourself the question is, are they good for what they're built for? It's not a top trumps game. It really isn't. And this is one of the whole fun I find of getting into some of the stuff of history these days that we do have this top trumps game. Well, let's look at this class. They are an oddity. They are even the most passionate American uh, American Navy flag waving. They can do no wrong. Seem to have no qualms with telling me, yeah, Salt Lake and City and Pensacola. Um, they had good crews. The amount of times I hear the phrase they had good crews, and I go, yes, they did. They had very good crews. But why were they built like they were built? Why? Why get obsess over getting 10 guns? Why build this sort of free to arrangement at both ends? Well, as we all know, speed of a ship is a function of its length to beam ratio. So, we could sit there and go, well, you're pretty much putting in most of a triple turret, two tri extra triple turrets, etc., to save roughly a thousand tons. Let's be honest. The British counties are 10,400 tons standard, so if the Americans had come in at 10,400, would anyone have worried? And also, this is a period, remember, these are built when there is no tonnage limitation in terms of the wider fleet. You can build as many ships as you like. So... What are they doing? They're not just staying inside the treaty limits, they're staying a thousand tons inside the treaty limits. And as that is part of a compromise, they are putting a twin turret before a triple turret. Because that allows them to maintain the length to beam ratio and to keep the hull slender for longer to allow it to cut through water and be quicker. This also makes them top heavy, reduces stability, and makes their target, their actual firing, far less accurate because of the motion of the ship. But, you know, we're going to do this. How do I put this politely? I look at these ships and I look at what the designs that the US Navy were considering during the Genesis. And I come to the conclusion 
that the US Navy really didn't understand what it was building cruisers for. It didn't. It was building ships whose purpose was some role. But they didn't understand where cruisers fitted in their pantheon of naval operations. They'd had plans for their battle cruisers. Were these cruisers supposed to step up and take on the role of the battle cruisers? Oh, I was building Lexington and Saratoga for that. So were they going to escort Lexington and Saratoga and act in concert with them? Well, yeah. In which case, is their speed a function of their ability to keep up the carriers? Potentially. It makes sense. But there's also this 10-gun thing. The US Navy had got used to building ships with more guns. It really had. And the design here is all about packing in the guns. And the torpedoes. And the guns. And the torpedoes. And the guns. They had a speed of 32 and a half knots. And they had a tremendous range. Again, something which the hull assisted with. A range of 10,000 nautical miles at 15 knots. Again, this is all important for operating with a scouting fleet. Or with a battle fleet in the distances of the Pacific. So there are lots of good reasons for the decisions they're taking. There's even some armour. Not much, but there again, compared to other ships at the time, you can't be that annoyed by something which carries uh, four inches of belt armour. After all, how thick were the plates which the counties miraculously had installed? So, for starters, we can't call them heavy cruisers. They are, according to the 1930 treaty, a heavy cruiser because they have 8-inch guns. But in 1920s, when they were built, they were just a cruiser. Yes, they had the 8-inch guns, which were the biggest you were allowed to fit to a cruiser. But they weren't a heavy cruiser. They weren't a fighting cruiser. And this is the other thing you have to remember, the counties, really. They aren't a... That's the point. The counties, I mean, to, to an extent, benefit from this on our designs. Is they are fighty cruisers from the beginning. That is part of their construction, part of their thought process. These are scouting cruisers. They have their heavy weapons as a way of getting themselves out of trouble. Or hopefully overroaring potential trouble so it doesn't engage them. Remember, you don't want to fight for information. That tells the enemy what you know, and it also causes you trouble in that you get spotted. Far more. Even a fight with a small ship that you quickly put down will create far more of a ripple than you just getting in and getting out and being a thing on the distance. Which they weren't quite sure what it was. I do love this. The Brooklyn Navy Yard. It's one of those more interesting places. And um, yes, I especially love the pictures of all those sort of those streets running off it. <laughs> I would love it if some of the trees had been built to be that straight for the um, Royal Navy to go through. But it's a critical space for the US Navy. And then building a cruiser matters. The fact that they are building the cruisers matters. When you consider the US Navy is not building a lot of ships this time. Yes, they've been churning out destroyers like pretty much everyone else has. But they are not building that many ships. It will be in use from 1806 to 1966. So it's been part of them for a long time. 
and this photo is taken in 1918 so okay it's not quite up to date but it's also not that far out of date for this period gives you a nice idea of what's going on The Brooklyn Navy Yard is critical for this US Navy's operations and its fleet design and construction. And it's one of the better yards. But what interests me about this class is if you consider the Royal Navy when they've been building two ship classes, there's no question where would the other ship be built? It'd be built in the same yard. But that's not what happens with Salt Lake City. She is built by the New York Shipbuilding Corporation, which, believe it or not, are in Camden, Jersey. I I am I, I I do not sort of really understand how the Brooklyn Naval Yard to me on the map looks much closer to New York than the what's called the New York Shipbuilding Corporation. But I'm presuming, like with various other organizations, they just happen to move. New York Shipbuilding Operation Corporation, of course, is considered most famous for building the Reuben James and the Indianapolis and the Kitty Hawk and the NS Savannah, plus the Four Aces. A really good shipyard. Though, interesting enough, Salt Lake City isn't mentioned as one of their productions, even though it was. Oh, I don't know. It's so sad. It really is. And, you know, where Pensacola comes from, well, they built many, many ships. So these are good yards. Uh, critical yards. You can see a forest of four stack destroyers awaiting final fitting out. This is war on industrial scale. This is industry. I see a lot of lovely, well-meaning posts these days on Twitter and various other points going... This was the battle which decided the fate of World War II. It's not. <laughs> no. World War II, the fate of World War II was decided a long time before any guns started firing. It was. If you want a reason or example of that, you've got May 2022 as an example as we're currently speaking in Ukraine. War is decided by logistics and infrastructure. War is decided by factories. Long wars, big wars. Sure, small wars, they can be decided by tactical brilliance and luck. But in the end, if you're able to arm and put 100,000 men in the field, or 100,000 soldiers in the field, and the enemy is only able to put in 10,000, the odds are in your favour. If you can set thousands of tanks and you can maintain those tanks in the field, the odds are in your favour. It's industry like the Brooklyn Navy Yard, like the New York Shipbuilding Company. That's what decided the Battle of the Pacific. So the side of the Battle of the Atlantic, the shipyards in Britain, in Canada, in America. So decided it. it. Sounds terrible, because you think about it. You think about all these actions, all these brave people fighting. Yes, they have to actually fight, and the losses are going to be terrible. But in the end, the one who wins the battle is the one who can sustain those losses and keep going. 
and the trouble is for all the Axis forces, including Japan, thanks to the Washington and the London Treaty, and their own economy, actually, and their uh, most thing and their economic decisions, none of them had the industrial infrastructure and ability to continue the fight, to actually win the war. Which is a scary thing to admit sometimes, because that means when they started the war, some people on their sides knew they couldn't win if the war went long. That's why Blitzkrieg was the name of the day. And that's why Hitler keep banning on more and more targets for war was not sensible. So, Pentacolor. This is what she looked like in 1935. She's a pretty ship. Would she look better as a Northampton? Well, she'd probably look more pleasing to your eye because if you're experienced enough, that 2 free formation does throw you off a bit. What about her four float planes and two catapults? Well, that doesn't really matter things, does it? Torpedo launchers? Fine. Honestly, I have to say the forward mast looks a bit... Mm -hmm. But it's a tripod mast. None of them look, look that great. All of them looked like they were last seen standing outside a prison some, uh, somewhere going, you will not escape. And probably were. Salt Lake City? Prettier. Very, very pretty, that ship. Well, in that picture, anyway. There do see there are differences between the two. You can sort of pick them apart a bit, but Salt Lake City does seem to have, in some effects, the luckier career. And that earlier picture, which I showed you, this is taken after the Battle of Pasiforonga, which I've done a video on, which if you've Watch the video, you will know it was not exactly a wonderful victory for the US. In fact, it was pretty much a defeat. Pasifaronga. But the fact is, they managed to repair their ships and get them back into service. And it was a good job they did. Because they'd already been pretty darn useful. Pensacola has the first actions in World War II before even the war begins. Before even the war begins, on the 29th of November 1941, she departs Pearl Harbor. Eight days. Eight days. A little over a week. <clears throat> Bound for Manila in the Philippines. However, when she, they hear of the attack on Pearl Harbor, they're diverted to Australia. They enter Brisbane Harbor on the 22nd of December. And she returned herself to Pearl Harbor on 19th of January 1942. It would be February 1942 when she'd rendezvous with in uh, at the coast of Samoa with Task Force 11, which had been built around Lexington. Rather appropriate because that's what she was built for. She was built to be a scout cruiser alongside the battle cruisers, aka okay. now the aircraft carriers. Lexington and Saratoga, which actually didn't ever really make it that much into the scout force, but I will deal with that another time. There will be another video. So this convoy. Well, Pensacola convoy is pretty darn interesting as a story. It is. They take a brigade from the U.S. Field Artillery Corps, Corps along with 2,000 National Guard servicemen. Its a convoy includes the USS Niagara, a gunboat, uh, U.S. Navy transports, Republic and Shomo, U.S. Army transport ship, the Willard, uh, Willard A. Holbrook, and Magus, plus the merger ships, 
Admiral Holstead and Coast Farmer, and a Dutch merchant ship, Blofenting. U.S. Field Artillery Corps. We're going to ride 2,000 National Guard troops. 2nd Battalion, 131st Field Artillery Regiment, Texas National Guard, National Guard. 1st and 2nd Battalion, 147th Field Artillery Regiment, South Dakota National Guard. And 1st Battalion, 148th Field Artillery Regiment, Idaho National Guard. Plus, there were 2,600 U.S. Army Air Force per uh, personnel aboard. And in the crates, in ships, 52 Douglas A-24 dive bombers on the 27th Bombardment Group Light. 18 crated Holter Curtis P-40 fighters on the 35th Pursuit Group Interceptor on Blomfain team. And 48 pilots of the 35th travelled on the Republic. And 39 newly graduated but um, brand new pilots were aboard the Holbrook. Plus, they're transporting... 20 75mm field artillery pieces, AA ammunition, 2,500 uh, pound bombs, 3,000 30 pound bombs, 340 motor vehicles, 9,000 barrels of aviation fuel, 500,000 rounds of 0.5 caliber in, in, in ammunition, 9,600 rounds of 37mm anti aircraft shells. That is a critical group. And Pensacola is the guard of all of them. They sailed from Fiji following the zigzag course. Yeah, they'd been discussed the whole point, and uh, the the moment they attacked, they were discussed. And pretty much what happened was the Royal Australian Navy, HMS cruiser, their cruisers, HMS Canberra, the County class, HMS Perth, the Le uh, the Anthian class. And joined by HM, NZS, Achilles, Leander class of New Zealand Navy, and the Rear Admiral joined and raced to get to the convoy to protect, give it extra protection. So to have more than Pensacola as protection. They were also joined by HMS Swan. A Grimsey class sloop of the Royal Australian Navy, and HMS Warango, um, also another Grimsby class a sloop of the Royal Australian Navy, trying to help them with the anti submarine warfare duties because for some reason the British were thinking cruisers, cruisers, not the best for anti submarine warfare. And that is how they rendezvous and they get to Australia. It's something to think about. This is a convoy which is going before war has even begun. The infrastructure is already moving. You can. It's an interesting thing to uh, war game. What exactly happens if all this had reached the Philippines before the Japanese invaded? That's a lot of artillery. And a lot of aviation power. Does it change the outcome? Mm, of the Philippines? Not really. But could it have changed the outcome if it had been deployed elsewhere? I think it could have been. I did a war game once where this convoy ended up being sent with all its aircraft, everything, to sit in Singapore. Just as a random reason, just to see if it, what would happen. And it was quite interesting because you have some very experienced officers connected with the convoy who really know what they're doing. And when they get to Singapore, that artillery, etc., Arriving in time it does provides that much more protection against anyone trying to cross the Singapore Strait. The AA firepower is useful, the fighters, everything multiplies the force strength of Singapore. Uh, 
and provides more time for the British and Commonwealth forces in Singapore to organise themselves properly. Do Little Raid. What was Salt Lake City doing? Well, she takes part in the Do Little Raid. And when I say she takes part in Do Little Raid, she's pretty darn critical to it. Because, let's consider, the forces sent are two carriers, four cruisers, and eight destroyers. Which is not a lot of escort for such a critical mission. That's basically relying on people not hearing them to survive. Always nice to know when you have that. People are sort of relying on not hearing you. Now, she's joined in this by Vincennes, a New Orleans class cruiser. That would be sunk at the Battle of Savo Island. Northampton, the class which came after her, Salt Lake City, and Nashville. I always like it when a Brooklyn class cruiser turns up. They're usually so bouncy. And eight destroyers. Bark, Fanning, Benham, Ellet, Gwyn, Meredith, Grayson, and Munson. Two fleet oilers were also necessary to get the force on. You start to realise this is a, actually a massive group. If they could send bigger and support bigger more, they probably would have sent them. But they're relying on them only running across anything by accident and it not being much. And that basically anything they have can be taken care of by either the Enterprise's aircraft or those free heavy cruisers. Or those destroyers. Probably with Nashville leading them. That's what they're relying on. Do level raid is incredibly risky. And I'm not saying this because the Americans, as I mentioned before, there was never really any chance of them losing the war because of their infrastructure and the actual amount of industry they referred to. What the only way they could lost the war is if their morale was broken. But if you had managed to somehow take out Hornet Enterprise. Those four cruisers, and those eight destroyers, and those two oilers. The Allied war effort in naval terms in the Pacific would have been dead as a doornail for 18 months. Yes, the US Navy takes time and steps back before launching attacks and doing uh, getting really into the war, but... That's because it's it's building up its resources after Pearl Harbor. It's mainly getting oilers out there, which were just not available yet. With the Doolittle Raid, they are risking pretty much their entirety of what could be called considered a mobility force on this operation. Now, they'll do a lot during the war, as I've already mentioned the Battle of Pasifonga and a few others. But I wanted to mention Task Force 54 and their time off Okinawa, because they did a lot there. It's one of those scenarios where you're sort of going, ooh. What are you here for? What are you doing? Why are you doing this? And really, they're doing it because sending everything they can matters. Okinawa is a force which is something which needs to be done. And waiting for it to just perish on the vine wasn't an option. So if you're going to do it, your best chance of survivability lies in mass. Which is a scary thing to think about. Okay. Basically, you're saying, the more ships we have, the more the enemy will divide themselves to attack our ships and the more anti-aircraft fire we can leverage and the more firepower we have to direct against targets ashore. So Task Force 54 is where they have, in many ways, their last hurrah. It's where they get to do really important things. Because they didn't do the invasion of Japan, that didn't happen.
but both of them were still here and still critical at this point, which is something something worthy of respect. Okay, yes, I'm I I can take the proverbial sarcastic biscuit out of their gun arrangement all day and all night because there are reasons for it but the US Navy had better ideas they have better plans honestly the free turrets in the sort of the a B and X position with Y turret taken for other things that looks a pretty good design to me uh, we'll get back to this one It does. That looks a pretty cool design as well. I'll go back to Genesis and I'll show you. This design. I'd have said that would have been better, but less conventional than this one. Yes, I know it's got the guns twisted around in a funny order. Usually it goes the small turret above the larger turret. But that's because they're trying to make the hull thinner. And I know they don't need to do it at the stern. <coughs> you don't need to tell me that. But they decided that, frankly, it was better from a targeting perspective to keep it come out common both ways. So the option they could have gone full German and had a triple turret forward and two triple turrets aft. And that would also allow them to have a thinner turret, a thinner forward. But no. No. I go with this design. And that is Ultimately, because they're trying to make it as conventionally unconventional as possible. It looks very much like a conventional cruiser. And when I say conventional cruiser, I mean a 19... Well, 1920s, 1930s cruiser. It's got four turrets. Which is important, because the counties have four turrets. And it has ten guns, which is important, because the counties have eight guns. And it carries more aircraft, because that's important. And it's sc a capable scout ship, and it's got a long range. And then you start to realise very much that these cruisers are the shape they are, because you're not going to have a war with the British, but you're still in competition with them. And that's something to worry about. Because it starts to make you look at all the other ship designs, the American ones and the British ones. And look at how much of that decision decisions were based in the actual military naval need. And how much was based in, we want to be one better than the other person. These cruisers are a good example of trying to be, of just being, be going for being better. The other option they could have gone for, four twin turrets. Used the extra tonnage to get range, or just reduced the tonnage even more. Would have been great when the actual tonnage limitations came into existence in 1930. When you consider that from the Northampton class onwards, they'd adopt the uh, triple, tri the triple, triple approach. Still have one more turret than the British, can uh, one more gun than the British, just one turret less. So you could argue they swapped a turret for a gun. These ships are status ships. From the very beginning, they are status ships. 
as well as being cruisers for reconnaissance, as well as being present ships, as well as being economic warfare vessels with the limits within the limitations of the Pacific camp any Pacific campaign. They are status ships. We can't build are not building capital ships. These are going to be our status. We can therefore not afford for them to be look weaker than our opponents. We can't afford it. Which is terrible. But not unusual. It's terrible, but it is not unusual when it comes to designing ships. <laughs> People don't want to look weak or less capable than they can. So, summary, and this is the end of Salt Lake City, and this is... I am, to an extent, I have to admit, glad I've started the Pensacola class, because I've divided, to an extent, what was originally going into this video into two videos. One part's already recorded. That's an introduction to US cruiser doctrine, and it's an overview. But I'm going to get into more of US cruiser doctrine as we go through these ships, as we go through the classes. Because the Pensacola class When they are built, they don't know what they want. I, the more I've read books, the more I've realized that the reason the historians haven't come down on a firm view of why these ships are built is because everyone can present and uh, present their own compelling arguments for why their point of view is correct, because every one of them is is corroborated by evidence. And this is why I say they don't know what they want, because they're actually almost trying to build a ship which fulfills too many roles and too many well-argued pieces of doctrine than actually one well-argued piece of doctrine. There's a saying, too many cooks spoil the broth. But the Pensacola isn't that. The Pensacola is like, you've got five spectacular dishes. Each one individually an amazing meal. But instead of cooking one, you try and cook all five in one dish. So what you get is individually, if you look at those components, actually very good. But the whole looks muddled and confused and like you had no actual plan. It's got these wonderful, elegant lines of the hull, even when it's being blown up. After it's already been nuked twice and not uh, not sunk, sort this is sort of like being blown up. And you sit there and go... That's evil. But leaving that to one side, the hull looks beautiful, razor-like and fine. Honestly, that hull, if it had been a six-inch gun light cruiser, would have been, ooh, surging. But no. They're not six-inch gun light cruisers. They're eight-inch guns. Okay. Well, they got a triple eight-inch turret, and it's a really nice design. Oh. I got a twin eight inch turret, which is a fairly decent design as well. I got both in the same ship. Okay, other navies do that. The US Navy itself has done that a couple of times. That's nothing wrong. They spin them around so the twin is in front of the triple. Oh. Well, okay. They'll create top weight issues. But they're. There can be good reasons for that. You still get that fine, really fine, sexy hull. And the more you look at these ships, the more you realise that each of those individual bits makes sense, but not as a part of the whole.
it's like the Bureau of Ships is testing out all their ideas for cruiser construction and for what they want a cruiser to be in these pair, this pair of ships. They've given it to two of their best shipyards to churn out. And then, then going to cherry pick from that what works. And that might be the case, but you don't do that with two ships. If you're going to produce a ship which is almost a Frankenstein's monster of perfect ideas, of excellent ideas, then you don't produce a class, you produce a one-off and you test it. Or you test out some of those ideas in one class and then you take the ones that work and put them in the next, idea, the next class with some other, some other ideas and you test them out and you do it that way. Because if these ships had turned out to be less thoroughly calculated and instead of being top heavy they'd been dangerously top heavy I wish it's not beyond the wit of creation for that to happen. There is a reason the well, how do I put this? It, it goes and in terms of elevation, it goes twin turret, triple turret, triple turret, on the sort of same level as the Ford twin, twin turret. Cutting down and organizing things like that probably helped with the top way to shoot something chronic. And I do say something chronic because the top weight could have been a major problem for the Pensacola class. It is a handling issue. But none of the problems this sort of mixture of designs proves decisively bad for them. You almost begrudgingly have to say they're a good class, especially when you look at their individual components, because of the fact they do survive World War II, they do serve throughout, and they do so well. So when I say that I am not keen on the class. I don't. I'm not their biggest fan, especially because of the way the design has been built. It's not because I don't like the class. It's because they weren't treat when they were being built and adding in all these perfect bits, these bits individual fiefdoms had fought for. It's the disrespect of the ship. It's the disrespect of the crew. It's the disrespect of what it could have done and could have been. These ships were potentially, should have been, incredibly capable, stunning units. And instead, Instead, they've been turned into almost curiosities. Because no one stood there and said, no, enough is enough. We've got this idea, we've got this idea, we've got this idea. We want a super fine hull. Fine. You want more guns than the British. Fine. Nine will do. We've got an excellent triple turret, we've got an extra twin turret. We can either have eight guns, the same as British, or we can have nine guns. One more, but one less turret. You want to incorporate aircraft, that's excellent. You want four aircraft, that's fine. Okay, well, how are we going to do this? We've got a good idea of hanging off the stern, but you want to, do you want to put them in the centre? Why do you want to put them in the centre? What makes sense of having the fuel and all the storage there in the centre? The US Navy will often prefer to stick them over the aisle. There are many, many points at, on the development of these ships that someone could have stood there and said, enough is enough. This is going to be a cruiser. This is going to be the pride of the US Navy. And they didn't. Now, you can say they didn't because they still had all the battleships they did and because they had all the numbers, but they... This is the thing. You know the biggest ships you're going to be building 
under the Washington Treaty System is going to be a cruiser of up to 10,000 tons of 8-inch guns. So that's going to be your status build. So treat it as such. And if you need to spend another six months on the de design board arguing it out with people, then do it. Now, of course, today is the Pensacola class. And tomorrow, the 8th of June, is going to be the cruisers of the London Equitable London Treaty. And believe it or not, this will feed into some of the thoughts for that. Now, I'm going to say also this. I'm starting off the US Cruiser series, and if someone's actually watched the whole end, please say if you think it's the case, but this that's not going to be the question at the end. I'm going to sound at some point rather cruel about the US Navy's design, because they do some very, very bad things. In some ways, I've been holding my punches for the Pensacola class because I don't think they really deserve it because they're a rather easy one to stick the boot in on and it's not their fault. It's not the design's fault. It's the designers who allow, allow all those different ideas to be put included in their design. All those different dishes to try to make one. I'll have more problem with the ships when they've allowed errors to go in when they've only been building one dish. It's like when I'm dealing with the Royal Navy. I treat the US Navy as the same. In some respects, therefore, this means I do have bias. Because for both of them, I expect them to do their best. I expect them to produce the best ships they are capable of building at that period to fit the role that they are seeking and they are claiming they're seeking to fit. And if they don't, I hold them accountable for it. Just as I did with the Cup Prowess Counties. I have no qualms with saying this was a bad idea made for political reasons. So if you accept that, that's good. Today's question. What would you have built? If you'd been given the option of being chief designer, someone parachutes you into the room through the time rift and puts you in a room and you have the rank of chief designer in charge of the Pensacola program, what do you do? What do you do to make that design worthy of all its, all its components and of, be, of the ships? which will serve in World War II and will have distinction. Right. Thank you very much. Take care and hope you enjoyed. And before I go, thank you again for all your support. I really wouldn't be in Canada. I wouldn't be doing anything I'm doing without you so thank you for the super chats thank you for the super thanks thank you for all the patrons thank you for all the subscribers all the viewers all the people who joined the channel the people who donated thank you people who just gave me money it's very so kind of you thank you very much take care